very much. It's a pleasure to be here on this beautiful, this is, this is a warm day for us in Boston, so maybe not, maybe not for you. Um, I, I, I wanted uh, to talk about a little bit about uh, how I wrote this book, uh, Death in the Haymarket, and why I wrote it, and then because I think some of you may not be up to date on all of the events, I wanted to present some images, because uh, they're very powerful images of what happened in Chicago in 1886 and afterward, and use that as a platform for um, telling you about the Haymarket Affair and why it was such a notorious event, and why it um, aroused people so much, why it was such a national trauma, and especially traumatic for the people of Chicago, and why its memory uh, endured for so long, and, and even uh, until today. Um, I was just talking a minute ago with, with someone in the room about, about the, the, uh, the, uh, the art of storytelling. Um, in the, in academic, the academic world, um, those of us who, who write history uh, are always looking uh, for new subjects that have been on, on, on mind before or unstudied or looking for some dramatic new interpretation of something. I was asked to write this um, book by an editor in New York, uh, at Pantheon Books, um, because he thought there was a gripping dramatic story here that would draw readers into learning about the nation's first labor movement with all the tensions that had involved and all the passions. And since my, my dedicated field is labor history, I realized this was a sort of chance of a lifetime to tell a story um, and introduce people to subject matter um, they, hadn't, they hadn't read about before. Uh, I was really reaching for the general nonfiction reading public. And uh, I've looked occasionally uh, at where my book is in, among 19th century books and Amazon and all that. And it's, it's, it's doing all right, but I look, I look at all the other books ahead of me at, on the list, and there are many, of course, but uh, David McCullough is always number one, and Doris Kearns Goodwin. But they're all books about presidents or battles. So, but this was the only book uh, in 19th century uh, among the top 50 or whatever it was that was about immigrants or about workers, or about unions, or about um, political violence, or, or, or struggles that had to do with uh, the eight-hour day, or any of these things. So, so I, 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 fe I feel as though I made a little bit of a dent into that market anyway. Um, and I, I, I realized that, although I was self-conscious about doing a book that had been about a subject that had been written about so much before, I really realized that I had an opportunity to um, retell an old story that was really a great story, a courtroom drama that a novelist would die for, uh, but retell an old story for a new time. Because the last book about this was published in 1984, and you know I don't have to tell you what we've lived through uh, in the last uh, six years or so that make us think much more deeply uh, about acts of political violence and about the consequences of what happens when these kinds of things happen and, 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 and the society reacts. My, um, my uh, friend and advisor uh, on this was Howard Zinn, and he, I said to him, Howard, do I really want to write a book that's been covered by so many other people? And he said, well, you can, and, and I, I said, you can write it in your own voice, he said. And I also said, do I really want to, this, I was considering this in the um, fall of 2001, I said, do I really want to write a book about an event where seven police died at the hands of what people would now call terrorists, won't uh, my study simply be dismissed as some sort of um, know, some sort of account of the nation's first terrorist and be misunderstood or something like that? And he said, "Well, no." He said, "By the time your book appears, people will probably want to get some perspective on these kinds of events and, and why they happen and what happens to all of us as a result." So those are some of my motives. I also realized as I was starting to write the book that in fact I could tell the story in a different way. That the previous studies of the event um, were, uh, and let me just say before I go on, let me just describe very briefly because I'll give you a, a longer version of this. This, this was a, a, a bombing that occurred in the west side of Chicago on the evening of May 4th, 1886 during a labor rally that was called by the city's anarchists. There was a very large anarchist movement in Chicago, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. Um, the, uh, the, the rally was called to protest uh, an act of what the anarchists and the workers 
regarded as an act of police brutality, the killing of two strikers by the Chicago police the night before. In what had been a peaceful strike, a, a mammoth strike for the eight-hour day, a general strike that was so amazing that Friedrich Engels was writing from uh, England at the time and said, uh, we don't have anything like this in Europe. The, American, the, the Americans are showing us the way. So this is an extremely unusual moment in American history and in world history. So that strike was going very peacefully until this police action and until the bombing that occurred afterwards. And I'll, I'll tell you about the intense reaction that sent in afterward because seven policemen were killed. And this was uh, something that had never happened in peacetime in this country before. And the reaction to it could only be described as hysterical and long-lasting. So, so this story had been, been told many times before, but, but I felt like it, it, it often lacked what I felt were the important contexts. Uh, the story was often told as a, a simply a, a story of, of violence, of, of, of crime and punishment, uh, or as a story of anarchism and anarchists and what happened to them uh, in this unlikely place they found themselves in, uh, uh, the, the, the citadel of, of 19th century capitalism. I wanted to tell the story in several other contexts that I thought would, would enrich it. Uh, and these are my personal, to my personal goals as a writer. The first, the subtitle of the book is A Story of Chicago. And I really wanted to write about Chicago and make Chicago a, a kind of a character in the story, more, more than a setting, a, a city that had a life of its own. Um, I was uh, born and raised in a small town just outside of Chicago, and I think a lot of us who were raised in those towns in Illinois and, and, and grew up in the shadow of Chicagoland and became writers wanted to write about Chicago. And, and I realized this, this was my chance uh, to do that. And so uh, the, the, the subtitle is borrowed from a, a, a novel by a great uh, muckraking writer, um, Frank Norris, who some of you may be familiar with his book, The Octopus. A less, a less known volume is called The Pit, a story of Chicago and the epic of wheat, which is set on the trading floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. So that's where I got my subtitle, A Story of Chicago, because the larger uh, context I want the reader to sense is that this is not simply a story about an act of political violence and the people who may or may not have committed it, but it's a story about um, a phase of American capitalism when all sorts of very brutal and primitive conflicts were unloosed by this, really, this uh, uh, high point of the Industrial Revolution, and Chicago was the epicenter of it. So I wanted it to be a story of Chicago. And, and I also wanted to do something that I felt hadn't been done before with uh, the story of American labor. That somehow, uh, labor history is, uh, as used to be the case with black history and women's history, was ne never seen as part of the national narrative. You would, in the textbook, you would hear about the, the homestead strike and the Carney and Frick suppressing the homestead strike and Frick almost being assassinated. But they were just little moments, just little episodes. So I, I really felt like what was going on in Chicago in the Gilded Age really put labor and, and the questions, the, the labor question, at the center of the national narrative. And, and what kind of a republic and what kind of a democracy we would be in, in my time, in our time, uh, and in, during Reconstruction, that question centered around race. Would America be uh, an egalitarian society? Would, in the, as the 1960s people said, would we have racial equality? In the Gilded Age, the, that, the question of what kind of a democracy we would have centered, or what kind of a republic we would have, centered around a, a great deal around the problem of class conflict. And so I wanted to, to illustrate that. So the book begins on May 1st. Uh, there's a series of May Days in the book, the whole series, of several of them. And so I, I started the book on May Day in Chicago in 1865, not 1886, which is when the strike occurred. And, and I just thought, uh, it's, it's always important as a writer to think where you're going to start and where you're going to end. And so I decided to start there because of something I read as a boy in Carl Sandburg's uh, Lincoln, The Prairie Years and the War Years. And May 1st, 1865 was the day Lincoln's body came back to Chicago. And Sandburg writes, as only he could in this uh, very uh, romantic way, 
about the people of Chicago lining the streets and marching up to see, because of course, Lincoln was an Illinois boy. His career went through Chicago. That's where he was nominated. And so I, I began there because I saw, as Sandberg did, I could imagine anyway, couldn't see it, imagine it, uh, wanted the reader to see it, uh, a city united in grief. All classes, all nationalities around this uh, martyr president, the death of this martyr president. So then my project was to try to show the reader, actually quite quickly, in very short chapters, how in 19, 20 years, that unity uh, split completely apart and the city was divided against itself. So that the bombing doesn't become the subject, it becomes almost the effect of things that have happened before. So the first context is Chicago. Uh, the second context, as the subtitle indicates, is the birth of the first labor movement. And this was my editor's thought, and mine as well, that if we could draw the reader into this, this larger story, they would learn about how um, workers first began to organize on a national level, why they thought the eight-hour day was such an important cause. Um, forgotten, I think, that people actually sacrificed their lives to gain this kind of freedom that they sought from work. More important to them than even in some ways than raising wages was having the, the time to educate themselves and, and become active citizens. It also allowed, allowed me to put immigrant, immigrant people right at the center of this story because the Chicago working class was um, overwhelmingly uh, uh, composed of immigrant peoples, mostly from uh, Central uh, Europe, uh, Germany, and, uh, and what is now Czech, Czech Republic, Bohemia, and, and, and Poland. Um, immigrants, I think, are somewhat neglected or ignored in the American story, even though in the Midwest, these were really the prominent, there, there were, the Chicago Tribune said in, in 1885, there, there are more Germans in Chicago than Anglo-Saxons. And they were worried about that. It was a Ger St. Louis was a German city. Cincinnati was a German city. So, so I just wanted to recreate that world to some extent and, and try to make these invisible immigrants uh, visible. And the third context, and the most problematic, was the context of today. Uh, a war on terror, a fear uh, of immigrants, illegal immigrants in our midst who might be as a New York Times put it, they said that the whole debate, New York Times said, on immigration reform has been hijacked, I'm paraphrasing here, hijacked by uh, stereotypes of illegal immigrants living among us like pod people. So, you know, I couldn't, as I read all these things of prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, and you'll see in a minute why all of this, <laughs> 1886, there were things that happened in 1886 and 1887 that are eerily similar to what we're going through now. So. So I wanted to um, just stay in that period, but let the reader see those resonances too, or hear those resonances, and maybe uh, ask some, some hard questions about how these things happen and how we respond to them. So, so let me begin by uh, telling you the story uh, visually um, and, and, and help you understand why this, I hope, why this was such an important uh, event and why it aroused such passionate controversy and, and still, still does, uh, even now. Um, I want to begin with uh, the, the Civil War period. Um, there was, um, which is where the book begins, uh, hardly a, a labor movement at all at the time. Uh, this is uh, Samuel Gompers, who, who came here, a Jewish immigrant from East London in 1863 to New York City. He saw there was a draft riot going on and the Irish people were in the streets rebelling against their own government, against the draft, attacking black people. So this was his introduction to the United States, you know, as a sort of sobering lesson. But, but young Gompers was a socialist and thought that instead of killing each other, <laughs> the, workers, the workers should organize. And that, that wasn't possible uh, for a long time. There were no labor laws protecting the right to organize, the right to strike, the right to do anything. Uh, if you tried to do that, uh, it was usually pretty easy to get an injunction in the courts to prevent you. Um, but nonetheless, after the war, partly I think because of Reconstruction, because of the Emancipation, the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, people believed, naively, uh, that um, equal rights for African American citizens had been secured because they were now citizens. And, and workers began to say, well, we have 
rights too. And the rights that they most were interested in was the right to the eight hour day. Um, and so a great movement arose uh, during that time. Uh, and in Illinois, the legislature was persuaded to pass the first eight hour law in the country to take effect, here's the next May Day, on May 1st, 1867. The employers uh, simply defied the law, refused to allow their workers to come back to work at eight hours a day. There was a strike, there was rioting, it was suppressed. So I thought this was a really important turning point because it said something to working people in Chicago, you can get a majority. You can get the governor to sign a law to get the reform that you want and the employers have the power to defy it. So this was a, a bitter lesson, I think, for them. Uh, there were other, even worse lessons that followed in, in Gomper's time that he observed as a young worker. Uh, terrible uh, incidents of violence. Um, the Molly Maguires in the Pennsylvania coal fields uh, engaged in what could only be called a civil war with the coal operators and their hired guards. This is a, there's a film about this called The Molly Maguires ending in the uh, trial for conspiracy of 19 uh, Irish miners uh, cons and, and their a public hanging of these 19 workers, which was not, uh, not well known outside of the Pennsylvania coal fields and in the Irish communities of the United States, but long remembered there, long remembered there. And this begins uh, a tragic 1875, 76, a tragic era of industrial violence, uh, of which Haymarket is some, in some ways a, a, an outstanding point in a, in a very sad and tragic way. Um, but uh, in 1877, there was, there was even more violence on the railroads when workers resisted wage cuts and, and, and things really became close to civil insurrection in Pittsburgh. Lots of people were killed. And Gompers, although this was a crushing defeat, concluded from this from the 1877 railroad strike, which began in West Virginia, went all the way up to Baltimore and Ohio, through Baltimore, through Pennsylvania, through Reading, through Pittsburgh, all the way to Chicago and St. Louis. I mean, this was something, uh, workers in St. Louis took over the city for a while. So this was uh, something quite unanticipated and quite frightening to the authorities. But for Gompers, he said it, it sounded a toxin, that there was this great potential power among workers if they could organize and not simply go into the streets and, and fight uh, for their lives. And this potential isn't really realized until the 1880s when the first modern unions begin to, to take shape. Modern in the sense that they had national ambitions. They weren't just local trade unions. Um, and uh, there was a group that Gompers founded of trade unions you know, in their own occupational groups, carpenters and plasterers and printers and cigar makers and people like that off in their groups of craft unions. And then there was one big organization, I call it the Big Tent Organization, called the Knights of Labor. Um, they were formed in 1869, but they really take off in the 1880s. And this is one of my favorite photos. I don't know, because of the light, if you can see the two men down here holding hands, clasping each other's hands in fraternal brotherhood. This is a, this is a, a, a photograph that's labeled the blue and the gray. These were guys who had fought against each other in the Civil War, in the Confederate Army and in the Union Army, and now they were fellow workers. So this was the idea of the Knights, you know, um, uh, a brotherhood, uh, a sense of regional solidarity that their bonds as workers transcended. The politicians were all waving a bloody shirt, you know, trying to get people to refight the Civil War at every election. And these men were saying, no, we have something in common even though we fought on different sides. This was a, not so much a trade union as was a grand reform movement uh, that it was extremely inclusive, hence uh, the big tent. And these are the lady knights. These are the, uh, one of them, this is uh, Elizabeth Rogers from Chicago with her newborn uh, baby. So, so women were welcome not only as wage earners but as housewives. Housewives could join the Knights of Labor because they too uh, were part of the great uh, productive class, a producing class. Uh, the only people who were excluded from the Knights <coughs> were, uh, <coughs> not, not by the way, not all manufacturers, employers could join if they agreed with the principles of the Knights, which was cooperation, let's arbitrate our disputes, let's not have strikes, let's have joint decision making and industrial democracy. The, the people who were excluded were unproductive people. Uh, lawyers, 
uh, liquor salesmen, gamblers, and real estate speculators. Otherwise, the big tent was, actually, I should say, most importantly, Chinese workers. And the view of the time, which was obviously very much a racially uh, determined one, was that the employers were simply using uh, Chinese uh, contract labor to undermine the wages of, quote, American workers. So, on the one hand, uh, this is Frank Farrell, the African-American leader of the Knights of Labor. Uh, African-Americans were welcome to join their own, form their own orders. They even went to, to Richmond, Virginia, and, and the hotel owner said, you can't have an integrated meeting here, and they insisted, they demanded that the blacks and whites meet in the same rooms because um, African-Americans were Americans, they were citizens, they were workers, they were established here, but not the Chinese. So this was the great blemish on the, the Knights of Labor and sort of undermined uh, their, their vision of brotherhood because it only extended to, to certain groups, certain groups of people, which was a, uh, unfortunately the common assumption of the time, which some of you may have studied, the historians of whiteness. Uh, this was certainly true of the Knights of Labor, except that in the case of blacks, there was a kind of uh, parallel sense of brotherhood. The blacks could have their own organization, we would have ours, and we would work together in this one great solidarity, as they, as they called it. Um, the, and the, they would demonstrate this. The first Labor Day demonstrations occur in, in this period. This is in New York in the early 1880s. And they were really inviting the public, the middle class, as it were, to identify with them. We were all, we were all the producing people. The, the people who were, the enemies were the, the super rich, the speculators, the money dealers, the Wall Street people. And the Knights of Labor and, and the general public were going to take the republic back for the people. So they ran candidates uh, on the Union Labor Party. Um, they really had a, a view uh, that is, uh, I think, probably disappeared in the 20th century uh, based on uh, beliefs such as this. Um, labor produces all wealth. Labor is prior to capital. Without labor, there is no capital. They, they weren't Marxists, they, but they had this labor theory of value. And if you look at the speeches of Abraham Lincoln when he was running for president in 1860, he was saying these things. And we have the right to demonstrate and protest. It was a kind of notion of economic citizenship. The only 20th century uh, example I can think of that resembles the Knights of Labor in, in, in any particular way. It doesn't come from here, but, but actually from Poland. In, 18, in 1981, there was a, a Solidarity was formed in Gdansk, Poland, and everybody in Gdansk belonged to Solidarity, who was, except for the party people and the apparatchiks and the managers. And, and, and so that's kind of what the Knights of Labor were trying to achieve. Um, take the Republic back uh, for the working people. And they had, they had powerful uh, opponents. Uh, there were, this was the age of the first great robber barons who had uh, uh, enormous wealth and resources and enormous access to political power. You all know, of course, that the U.S. Senate in those days was not popularly elected. It was appointed by, by state legislatures so people could buy the U.S. Senators, they could buy. This is Jay Gould, who was the, uh, the most, maybe the most powerful industrialist and financier of his time, uh, owns a vast railroad net network, controls Western Union, the Telegraph Company. And by the way, a very, a very cynical and outspoken man. People were very candid about these, the, what they were uh, uh, saying publicly. Jay Gould once said, well, what about the Knights of Labor? And he said, I'm not worried. I can hire one half of the working class to kill the other half. So these were, these were men who didn't mince. Uh, they, they were worried about PR spin in those days. You know, they just said, um, but, but it, he got a surprise in 1885 when the Knights of Labor on his southwestern system went out in a strike. And uh, they were unprepared for it, the railroad, and they won. And this, this was just like a thunderbolt going off in the sky. Suddenly workers rushed to join the Knights of Labor because there was this moment where they didn't think they could achieve anything. All of a sudden, they could achieve a victory against the most powerful economic figure in the United States. And so there was a great a great enthusiasm to join uh, the Knights of Labor, and even though the leadership of the Knights of Labor opposed this, to go on strike. Suddenly the idea of going on strike on a mass level, a general strike, seemed like a very powerful, powerful weapon, a weapon of the weak. Um, 
All the strikes in the United States have been a small scale affairs, uh, except for 1877 and this one. Uh, and but what but what were they? What did they really want? Well, a living wage was one thing, which is still. <laughs> You look at ordinances that are being passed all over the country, still on the, the, the on the table, but but they also wanted something else. They wanted um, an eight-hour day, which which had a kind of m m uh, um, visionary uh, quality to it. That this they would become citizens now. They would be able to become fuller people. They would more work would be spread out. It was kind of a panacea. They they thought, and it was also something else. It was a it was a cry for freedom against what was a very arbitrarily dictated work regime, where people were still working from sunup to sundown, where you went to work when it was dark and you came home when it was dark, and your children did too, your teenagers who went. So people people felt like they were living to work, not working to live. So this so this movement for the eight hour, and this is an example of what they what they were what they were up against is that the, 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 there was very little freedom over the work week or 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 the work day. Some of you may have seen this a bumper sticker: the, the the labor movement, the folks who brought you the weekend. Well, they didn't. You know, in those days, most people worked on Saturday, and some people had to work on Sunday. So that's why this was a powerful <coughs> a powerful cause. This is a, a a banner actually from Australia, which indicates that it had also an international flavor to it, this struggle for the eight-hour day. And in this particular cause, the Americans were seen as the leaders, the world leaders in this, in this struggle. Um, and this is, uh, this is Gompers uh, himself uh, as a leader of the eight-hour day. And the organization that he represented decided to do something bold. They decided to call a referendum among all of its members to, to, to launch a general strike for the eight-hour day on May 1st, 1886. And it passes overwhelmingly. Nothing like this had ever been uh, conceived of or attempted before. And when uh, May arrived, it was uh, quite a stunning spectacle. All over the United States, uh, people were, went out peacefully uh, you can see some of the banners here, eight hours peacefully if possible, forcibly, forcefully if we must, because they had given up on legislation um, for the most part. They didn't believe the eight-hour laws, even if they were passed, the courts would throw them out. Even if they were passed, the employers would defy them. So they meant to, 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 to compel the employers to give them eight hours, and that was their goal. And, and many were conceding. Maybe they'd give in nine hours and in Chicago, the whole city was paralyzed uh, by this uh, eight-hour uh, this eight-hour strike, um, um, and there and there uh, the anarchists were very prominent. The city had several different leaders of the labor movement, and um, anarchists were uh, among them Germans for the most part. Um, and this is the scene in other city. You probably can't read read this, but just in um, you get a sense of the larger headlines anyway and, and what it says down below waiting awaiting the outcome in Chicago so this was this was the real center of the whole drama but down below it says 14,000 people struck in Louisville Kentucky you know so that's that's the extent of, uh, of, of the, of the, uh, of the demonstration and it was a uh, although it was peaceful there was a, a lot of tension but this is a, a, a painting that had been called the strike that was actually painted in 1886 by uh, a worker artist named uh, Robert Kohler from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And this is a manufacturer with a high hat in the factory up there, and workers coming down, and this guy in the red shirt, probably a socialist, the red shirt is, but, uh, is negotiating, and this guy's picking up a rock over here, which sort of shows you that it's a very tense moment. And, and so that painting sort of captures really the spirit of 1886, is that people were trying to behave in an <clears throat> orderly, Nonviolent way, but there was this pressure cooker building underneath this real, real tense, um, real tense atmosphere. The breadth of this strike uh, was really extraordinary because it wasn't only uh, these native-born railroad workers and miners. It was the immigrants who who had just come to the United States and who were working in sweatshops uh, on the west side of Chicago. Uh, Emma Goldman came here that just around that time was working as a young. Uh, uh, she was from Russia, working as a clothing worker, 17 years old in uh, Rochester, New York, got very involved in this. 
And, and, and so these isolated ghettos where people didn't even speak English were also caught up in this great enthusiasm for, uh, for the eight-hour day. People were joining the Knights of Labor just so they could go on strike. Uh, it was, it was a, and none of this was legal, and, and none, of it was, none of it was terribly well orchestrated or controlled from the top down. It was a, a more of a spontaneous uh, kind of uh, event. Um, so it had proceeded uh, with remarkable discipline and, and, and passivity uh, on May. Actually, the week before May 1st, people were going out winning concessions. The brewer, the German brewers in Chicago, even not only did they uh, get a shorter work day, they got more time to go to, for bathroom breaks, and they got uh, uh, freedom to go to the tap room and have free beer. Uh, during the work day, I mean, the things like that. So the workers were feeling, now oh, this is really, maybe we can really get some of the things we want. The work doesn't have to seem like prison. Um, and the things were going peacefully through Saturday. Sunday was May 2nd. That proceeded calmly. May 3rd, even more workers went out. And then something happened on the afternoon of May 3rd, of course, in Chicago, which is the center of where all the action is, that changed everything. And that was this um, event that I described earlier um, at the McCormick Works. This was a huge farm implement plant on the Chicago River that produced most of the reaping machines and things that, that were used in the great, huge Midwestern plains and the harvest. It was arguably one of the most important manufacturing plants in the United States. And it was run by um, Cyrus McCormick Jr., who was a uh, Princeton educated. And, he had taken it over from his father and his uncle, who were real um, inventors who really had a close relationship with their men, who were these very proud and very well-organized iron molders. And uh, nothing that Cyrus McCormick learned at Princeton prepared him for dealing with these workers, and, and he, did, he did, did very badly. So that the McCormick works becomes a kind of very tense battle zone. Um, lots of police, and for the first time, private police are brought in, Pinkertons. And this arouses the Irish community in Chicago because the Pinkertons had been responsible for sending the Molly Maguires to the gallows. So the very, very tense situation. And writing about this place um, was really, uh, it's kind of a writer's a dream because the, at the time, uh, the McCormick Harvester plant was called the Reaper Works on the Black Road, which I always thought was just perfect kind of description of, of, of the place and what happens there because Two workers are killed at the Reaper Works uh, that, by the Chicago police on the afternoon of May 3rd. Um, and so this, this is the, these are the first deaths. This is the first shooting and this mammoth strike. The anarchists who are there, one of them, August Spee, is a German, German leader of the anarchist movement, was there giving a speech. He goes back to Chicago, writes an indignant editorial in the Arbeiter Zeitung, which is a daily German newspaper, daily German newspaper that reaches 20,000 workers is sort of the Chicago Tribune of the working class. Mm -hmm. And he says, we cannot let this stand. Arm yourselves, fight back. You know, they're going to shoot us down like dogs. A very militant response. And the, but, but what the anarchists decided to do was not to call for going into the streets with guns, was to hold, like people usually do, hold a protest rally. So they called a protest rally for the night of May 4th in Haymarket Square on the west side. And this is the... Uh, uh, the flyer, the famous flyer. Um, one, some of them said, uh, arm yourselves. And Spee said, no, no, we don't want to go that far. So they tried to, t to shut those down and just send this one out. And you can see that it's, uh, it's in the Arbeiter. It's addressed in German and in, uh, in English. So, so the, the, the rally takes place um, at the square. Um, uh, the speakers were uh, August Spee's, the German. Um, and uh, most importantly, uh, this man, Albert Parsons, who was a, one of the few American-born um, activists in the movement. The rest of them were all Germans and Bohemians. He has a, a, a very interesting uh, story. He, he um, served in the Confederate Army as this 18-year-old as cavalryman, uh, came back to Texas, after the war and decided that not only the, the, the South had lost the war, which was obvious to everyone, but that in fact the victory would allow uh, the Union to go forward and, and grant civil rights to black people. And he became a supporter of Reconstruction and a supporter of the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment and a Republican, because in those days if you were fighting for, 
for freedom for blacks, political equality, you, you joined the party of Lincoln, the party of Reconstruction. He did that. Became a radical Republican. And something even worse, in Texas, he became a scalawag, which means, in effect, uh, a white Southerner who switched sides, or, if you will, a race traitor. And he, he uh, marries a, a woman, Lucy Parsons, who, who becomes his wife, who is uh, African-American and born in slavery. So, uh, very unusual Texas story. He winds up, they have to leave Texas, basically, because the Ku Klux Klan is out to, to, get, to kill them. Come to Chicago and get involved in the movement there. He, be, he moves consistently to the left by, as a result of experiences that he's had in Chicago as a worker losing his job for giving a speech in 1877, being counted out of office when he felt he was elected as a socialist. Uh, and uh, and uh, th th what was socialism at the time? Well, this is another Robert Kohler painting, very sensational painting called The Socialist. Uh, and there were, there were people uh, like that, not, and not just immigrants in, in the time, who, who were saying that um, this new emerging order uh, in the United States had to be uh, replaced by a cooperative order, which they called socialism, and Parsons was Parsons was uh, was one of those people. Were not only socialists were and anarchists were questioning capitalism and whether uh, it, it could survive or should survive. Many other Americans really weren't were calling into question the morality of the economic system. They were judging it by older standards uh, of fairness, of uh, Christian values and how people treated each other, and they didn't like uh, what they were seeing. So there was a, a kind of broad dissatisfaction with the way the country was going and the way that corporate capital was dominating uh, the scene. Also even uh, questioning the, the so-called laws of the marketplace, whether in fact employers should have the freedom and the power to simply determine wages and hours without anything, without anything else. So, so back to the um, back to the rally. Uh, this is a kind of very crude drawing of one of the speakers addressing the crowd that in the evening um, is about um, middle of the evening, and um, the crowd is starting to disperse. Parsons is speaking. The mayor comes and listens to Parsons' speech, and he wonders if he's going to be inciting to riot or anything. And he says, no, he says he's not saying anything to encourage violence. So he goes to the, uh, what Parsons didn't know when he was speaking there, he talks about premonitions of danger everywhere. What he didn't know was that there were 176 police about 200 yards away waiting to march on the rally. Uh, and the mayor goes there, he said, no, Parsons isn't saying anything incendiary. I don't see anyone with guns. He says to the police captain, you can send the reserves home. And the mayor, who was a very colorful figure, who wore a, a Kentuckian, who wore a slouch hat and smoked a cigar and rode a white horse. He, he, got, he got on his white thoroughbred horse and rode back to his mansion on Ashland Avenue, thinking that the evening was going to pass quietly because it was starting to rain. People were leaving to the saloon. There were 5,000 saloons in Chicago. And that's where people spent their, spent their evenings. Um, and even, even some of the anarchist speakers had gone to a local saloon, Parsons, and Parsons brought his wife and his children to the rally. He later said, how can you, how can you accuse me of, of conspiring to commit this bombing when I brought my wife and ch children to the event? Anyway, they were in the saloon. And um, the meeting was winding down, and the captain in charge, his name was John Bonfield, decided to march on the rally anyway, because he had had a bad blood. There was bad blood between the anarchists and the Chicago police. And he thought this was, we're not sure what he thought, but this was a chance to teach them a lesson. And he also knew the women and children had left. So they march on the rally. Uh, the police captain says, please, please dis you have to disperse this rally. And the speaker says, but we are peaceable, we're leaving. And they said, no, you have to disperse. And he started to climb down from the wagon. And just then, it's about 10.30, someone, and to this day we don't know who it was, threw uh, a grenade into the ranks of the police, which exploded, and one officer was killed immediately. Six more will perish in the next days. Uh, not entirely clear if all of these deaths resulted from the bomb, however, which was a very kind of crude gunpowder device, destructive enough as it was, but the police were packed, 176 of them packed into a street not, as, not much wider than this, 
they started shooting because they thought they were taking fire and maybe somebody from the crowd was shooting at them we don't know but they started shooting and uh, uh, unfortunately probably a lot of the police were hit and some were killed by what sometimes is called friendly fire Sh shot by their own guns they they also uh, of course pursued the remaining rally goers who were there shooting at them some of them were killed it was a then it became a riot and depending on which account you read it was either a police riot or something caused by the enemy not the first or last time the chicago police would be involved in something like um, these policemen were all carrying firearms, but, but they, they bought their own guns. And they were, they were not really trained to use them. They didn't do, you know, they weren't trained the way things can go wrong anyway. As we just saw in New York recently. But, so, so it was a panic and, and hysteria. Uh, and, and then um, this is the, uh, the press started to uh, describe it. This, this was, this was a, a drawing that came out a few days after the riot. But it's not what happened. You have the man still speaking when the bomb's going off as though in some ways he's orchestrating the whole thing. The anarchist is causing the bombing, and that was the impression uh, that people get. And it, it, this is what made the event so notorious. It becomes an uh, occasion to, for, for the United States, uh, the press in particular, the police, to engage in the first national Red Scare, uh, Red Roundup of, of people. So civil liberties were suspended. And, it was it was hard, it was hard to, to to recapture. Although I tried in the book the extreme uh, uh, anxiety and fear that this event uh, caused. Nothing like this had happened in peacetime before. There had been riots of all kinds. Black people were killed. Uh, Protestants and Catholics fighting with each other. There was a New York City draft riot. But the police were rarely killed. Not and certainly not seven and fifty wounded. And so this was very terrifying because here was. Uh, an act of violence committed by one individual, one bomb, that somehow uh, seemed uh, like the, cal the, the calculus of power had changed, that who knows how many bombs there were, who knows how many could be thrown. So you, you, you can grasp the, the fear that there was. And this, this crime was regarded as the worst crime that had been committed in America since the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, uh, and hence the trial of the century. <laughs> So the anarchists are rounded up, eight of them are chosen, um, it's not quite clear why, uh, to, to stand trial for being uh, involved in a conspiracy uh, to uh, uh, commit this bombing. Um, and they're also tried, however, the, state, the state's attorney said, this is the, the, the most overtly political trial in the United States, other than maybe the trials for treason, you know, John Brown or something like that. The prosecutor says, we're not only trying these men, for the crime we think they committed. And by the way, they had no, they did not arrest the actual perpetrator. They never charged anyone with actually throwing the bomb, but with being involved in a conspiracy. We're not only trying these men for the bombing, we're trying them for making, attempting to make anarchy the rule in America. So it was a political trial. And um, one of the key people involved in this story is uh, Lucy Parsons, who, Albert Parsons' wife, um, at first, um, she encourages and others encourage Parsons to flee the city because they're actually afraid of being lynched. They're, they're afraid of being dragged out of jail and, 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 and lynched because that was the mood of Chicago at the time. So he, he becomes a, a fugitive, the most hunted fugitive of the time, and she remains to face the Chicago police. She's arrested three or four times, becomes a, she was already a notorious figure, I, mean, I have to say that these anarchists were advocating the use of explosives in social struggles like this. They felt like they were involved in a street warfare, and when the, the police came after them, the National Guard and the Pinkertons, they had to have weapons too. They thought of themselves as people in the French Revolution on the barricades, or people in the Paris Commune, you know, who were fighting their own national army. Very romantic and, you know, uh, in, in some ways, illogical kind of strategy, but that's what that's what they thought. And I also think they felt that they wanted to encourage and embolden workers who were so intimidated by the police. And no, we have guns and bombs; we can fight back. So Lucy was one of them who who said that uh, uh, quite often. She, eventually, uh, she and, and the Albert's attorney uh, uh, persuade him to give himself up. So he comes and stands trial and. It's very clear from the beginning that there's no evidence to link him to the bombing whatsoever. 
but the prosecution is is trying him for what he said what he said about the use of dynamite so he's really being tried on what he said more than what he did um, and the, the trial this is a he becomes a kind of national celebrity because he's very charming he's very witty he tells jokes he sings he's an American <laughs> He's from Texas, so the reporters kind of fall in love with this guy. And here's a drawing by the famous Art Young. Of, and Parsons, who is a great actor, is playing this role to the hilt. You know, he realizes now he may not survive. He may not survive alive, but he's going to make the most of it. This is his moment on the stage, and so too with the other the other anarchists. And they become uh, newspapers come from all over the world. This the Franks Leslie's Illustrated ran cover photos of it and. And the anarchists are, do almost seem to be acting out some kind of play. This, this is August Spies on, on your right. He, he gets involved uh, with this woman, uh, Nina Van Zandt, who, who was um, a visitor to the prison, believes in the innocence of the anarchists, and falls in love with Spies. And they decide to get married in jail. <laughs> and the, they've already been condemned to death at this point. <clears throat> and so, this causes a national outrage with jailhouse romance, a scandal. And so it just went on like this. That one historian called it uh, uh, drama without end. A drama without end. And, and that, that included the execution as well, because uh, I can explain in detail later why four of these men ended up on the gallow. But uh, Albert Parsons is one, August Spies is another, and two Germans. And the way that they died, uh, there were so many witnesses and so many reporters there that. This was no ordinary public hanging, and, and public hangings were ordinary. But somehow there was something about this one because uh, that, that troubled people. Maybe it was because the way that these executions were supposed to take place uh, was written down. There was a sort of physics to this kind of death. You were supposed to fall a certain number of feet from the platform when the trap door opened, and if it was the right uh, distance, your neck would break and you would die instantly. It was supposed to be for these guys uh, six to eight feet, but the ropes were only long enough for them to fall four feet. So they all, you know, you know struggled and, and, and strangled to death. So this had a kind of um, appalling effect on the people who were in the witnessing. There were a hundred people there, reporters and others, who were not at all sympathetic to the anarchists, but somehow Oh, and they gave these amazing speeches from the platform before they, before they died. It was almost like something out of Shakespeare. So people were just very stunned by this. And, and there was a haunting feeling, even among those who, who thought the death sentence was correct, that maybe these men actually didn't commit the bombing. So there was that, that feeling as, as well. Um, so there's a reaction to this uh, around the world, rather surprising uh, reaction. Let me go back to this. Um, People in Spain and Italy, um, because the anarchist movements were very strong there, um, <coughs> they begin to see these men not only as victims of an injustice, but as martyrs, as martyrs for the world's first labor movement, for the eight-hour cause. And in fact, they are known, as I'll, as I'll point out later, as the Haymarket martyrs. In the mainstream press, however, the, the executions are widely celebrated and hailed uh, you can see the kind of uh, uh, image that emerges from this, which did an enormous damage uh, to, uh, to immigrants at, all over the United States who were pouring in by this time from, from Southern Europe as well as Northern Europe. So now uh, everyone was suspect. Uh, every immigrant was, was suspect. Uh, that was one of the uh, consequences of this. And you can see these are it's like they're hanging the crows here. So and Uncle Sam is fine. So there was this notion that if these men were put to death, uh, these troubles would come to an end, that, that, that the troubles that the United States had experienced were caused by anarchists, were caused by what today we would call terrorists, that there was nothing inside of us, there was nothing within us that was wrong. It was them, it was these outsiders who were coming here, even from Texas, which was considered in some ways an outside, a rebel of Texas. And, and so if we put these men to death, anarchy would be forever dead in the United States. And without saying it, then, well, maybe the violence would end. But of course, it didn't. In fact, the Haymarket triggers a period of much worse industrial violence that goes on in the United States until 1937, when the Memorial Day Massacre occurs again in Chicago. Hundreds of people are killed. So 
So the, the execution did not accomplish that, and in fact, it, 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 it had some other unintended consequences, which was to call into question the jury trial system in the United States, the, the sense that people could be, this was a packed jury, people were handpicked to serve on the jury who already believed these men were guilty, that people called into question capital punishment uh, in a way that was surprising for the time. Uh, how could men be sentenced to death when there was no material evidence linking them to a capital crime? How could they be sentenced to death for what they said? So, so in fact, the, the, established, the established authorities uh, experienced a sort of uh, wave of, 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 I don't know what you would call it, uh, criticism after, after this. And, and, um, and, and around the world, um, workers began to celebrate um, these men as their, as their heroes. And even as late as 18, 1986, at the centennial, you can see this, this Spanish, Spanish uh, por uh, portrait. They, in, in Mexico City, until the 1970s, when May Day, uh, Primero de Mayo, was celebrated in the great plaza there, uh, it was called the Day of the Chicago Martyrs. So somehow their deaths became symbolic of, of something that people around the world saw about America the same year the Statue of Liberty arrived. And people would sometimes juxtapose these two images of, of America as the land of, of, of liberty. And um, in fact, uh, May Day, uh, as, a, as an international workers' holiday, is in a strange way linked to the events in Chicago. Of course, that was the first May Day. Um, Prima, prima maggio. And at the beginning of, after that, the international labor movement decided to make May 1st um, their holiday. And, and of course, uh, not entirely by coincidence, this year, May Day 2006, was again an occasion for massive marches uh, for immigrant workers' rights. And I can tell you, because I was on a book tour, it was an unbelievable coincidence. I was just starting, well, not entirely coincidence, but what was happening was sort of unforetold, and, you know, so I was in going to New York to go to some bookstores and stuff, and my publicist called and said, can you be there on the morning of May 1st and go on with Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! because they want to talk about May Day, and where, and as I was speaking, they were showing signs of, you know, all the uh, immigrant workers in the streets in Los Angeles and Chicago and all that, so it's, it's having another uh, another kind of uh, revival, and um, so, so I hope that this helps um, illustrate why this was such a, a, a notorious and, and incident in American history, and uh, a great and tragic story, but something I hope we can all learn from. So, thanks very much, and I'll. Yes. Right uh, you didn't refer to any ethnic difference between the police and the workers. Yeah. Was there, were the police of different ethnicity that mm -hmm. have a particular... Some, somewhat, yeah. The, the Chicago police were um, heavily uh, Irish Catholic. And, and the, the Irish Catholic community was interested. They didn't want anything to do with socialism or anarchism. But in fact, they were the most militant workers in the city. They were the ones who caused all the trouble at McCormick's that got this whole thing going. So um, you could be I Irish Catholic and quite militant. So I think some brothers were in unions and others were in the police force. Uh, and some were Germans and Swedes, but they, they, um, they were immigrant workers themselves, a lot of them. I mean, that's why I, I tried to really um, make sure the police emerged in my story as real people. Sometimes they're just, oh, the police, you know, but they had names. They came, most of them came to work in Chicago and as teamsters and iron molers and got laid off and joined the police force. So they were, they, you know, there's, a, there's another, another group of Haymarket martyrs, and those are the seven police who died. So it's this, this kind of tragic pairing of the, the anarchists and the police both dying. If you really look back on it, unnecessarily. Necessarily, yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you say a few words about the lawyer who pardoned some of the guys who were sentenced? Yes, yes. This would be uh, Governor John Peter Altgeld, who uh, is kind of unusual, even in that, in that time of, of when we had so many immigrants uh, in Chicago and states like Illinois. He was a, a, a foreign born governor, foreign born person elected governor, uh, as you have 
here in California, but there haven't been haven't been too many of those. He, uh, he but he, he was a poor poor immigrant who uh, became a pretty successful lawyer in Chicago, and a very conservative Democrat in many ways. Although he had a, an unconventional side to him, he was very troubled by the prison system. He was very troubled by police brutality. Not a big partisan of the labor movement, but uh, a man who believed in the law and a man who understood what it was like to be an immigrant worker in America. So, and, and a judge, he was elected judge, who believed uh, deeply in the jury system and the rule of law. And he thought that the conduct of the Haymarket trial, uh, what he investigated it very deeply with the help of Clarence Darrow, by the way, who was his accolade at the time, accolade, uh, was a, a really a travesty of justice. So he issued uh, a pardon for the three anarchists who had been sentenced to prison, which, which became uh, one of the most controversial things a governor has ever done, because not only did he pardon these three anarchists who were, in effect, regarded as the terrorists of their day, whatever the evidence was against them, but he issued a stinging rebuke to the, whole, to the judge, to the jury, um, said that the trial had been conducted with malicious ferocity, uh, said that the cause of all the trouble was really the police and not the workers. I mean, this was, he went way beyond anything that uh, a pardon statement would have required. And as a result, he, he was, um, you can imagine the reaction. <laughs> I mean, he was, he said, he's, the Chicago Tribune said he's, a, he's, he's nothing but an anarchist at heart, you know. When in fact, what he wanted was to support uh, a legal system that would be fair to everyone. And he saw that that wasn't happening in Chicago. So he became a sort of hero in Illinois law, uh, particularly among German Americans, particularly among liberals and labor. But his career was really ruined by this. Uh, he was not able to, to win re-election uh, when he ran for re-election. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was a Republican Party operative at the time, came to Chicago and uh, accused uh, Altgeld of, 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 of favoring crimes of violence. It was totally outrageous stuff. But so he was. But he, he was well remembered in a, uh, a poem by Rachel Lindsay, and I uh, go back to Illinois, and there are all kinds of streets named after him. Every dining hall on the campus of any campus of the University of Illinois is named Old Gill Hall. So history was, uh, was very kind to him. Mm -hmm. What was the relationship between the uh, socialists and the anarchists yeah. at the time? And also, would you compare this incident uh, to the uh, Sacco Vanzetti, mm. Vanzetti case in terms of worldwide interest and uh, yeah, yeah. Let me let me take the second question first because I, I would and compare the two. They they were almost uh, bookends. You know, the 1887 execution of the four anarchists, the eight, 1927 execution of the two Italian anarchists uh, for crimes that were uh, you know mur murdering uh, and accused of murder and, and widespread belief that these these people, these immigrants, were really innocent. So the, the, the Haymarket story really uh, reverberated in the Sacco situation. It was remarkable how much uh, worldwide attention the Haymarket case got, but nothing like Sacco I mean, Sacco was, there were huge demonstrations and riots in Paris, and, and, and that was partly because uh, the, the Comintern was involved in this, you know, the Soviet Union was very much involved in, the, in that effort, but there were still uh, anarchist groups around the world, and so. But but I, I think that the issues that were raised by both cases are really very very similar, very very similar. Yes. And as far as the socialists and anarchists, um, the socialists had started in Chicago in a very promising way in the 1870s. They they ran a German doctor for mayor. Who, who determined the outcome of the election? He got 12,000 votes. They had a, because there were a lot of Germans who were who came here as socialists, and they were um, believed in using the electoral system. They were democrat, democratic in their strategy, and continued to believe that. Um, the people who became anarchists in my story had all been socialists before, and had abandoned socialism because they didn't. Th they thought the game was rigged. They thought that you couldn't really win a fair election. They thought electoral politics was controlled by people with money. Not true anymore, of course, but that's what they, that's what they thought, that it was really, a, the, the, the fix was on, and that they had been cheated out of, uh, that if, even if they ran and got a majority, they would be deprived of office. Not, not true anymore, of course.
Congress. But I mean, that's what they thought. And so they also, they also were, um, uh, th there actually were German workers' militias in Chicago at this time that were legal. You know, you could have, there's something in the Constitution about a you know, militia. And they formed these militia companies and they would drill and all. I said, well, why are you, why are you under arms? Said, well, we're trying to protect our meetings and our gatherings from the Pinkertons or from the police or whatever. We have a legal right to do this. Right to bear arms, right? Uh, the, the Supreme Court of Illinois said, well, no, you don't. We're taking away the right to form a workers' militia, but we're going to let the businessmen form their own militia company. So they thought, well, wait a minute. Now this is this is a constitutional right, and we're being so. This is all of these things drove them toward toward anarchism. They were also a highly romantic, highly dramatic people who who I think uh, sort of were inspired by. Like, Albert Parsons kept quoting Patrick Henry, you know, "Give me liberty or give me death." It was it was sort of all all or nothing, and they they were they were influenced by the American Revolution and the French Revolution. In other words, they, they, they really were revolutionaries, not reformers. And so, and so there was a big split between the socialists and the anarchists, as there would be. Uh, in the South, at the same time, following the compromise of 1873, there was tremendous violence against blacks. Yeah. Uh, There's a wave of terrorism. Yeah. And uh, is there any connection between the two? What this is right now, yeah. terrorism, and, yeah. and then the anarchists? Yeah. Well, you're, it's, it's important to point that out. Um, you know, um, the, the anarchists in Chicago for saying what they did, and someone threw that bomb, we don't really know who it, whoever he was, probably he, whoever he was certainly was a terrorist. Uh, but when you, when you look, if that was terrorism, then you compare to what the Ku Klux Klan was doing in the South, I mean, it's far beyond uh, anything uh, that you can, you, it's really much worse than you can imagine. And when, when Albert and Lucy Parsons were in Texas trying to fight for the rights of black uh, people, um, about 500 uh, black and white, black and white Texans who were fighting for the, those rights were, were killed by the Klan and by, by desperados. So, so it was a period of, of great terrorism. There was no link between, they, 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 the people didn't see the two things as being similar. In fact, a, a black editor T. Thomas Fortune said, in fact, wasn't very sympathetic at all to the anarchists, you know, or the, to the situation in Chicago. He said, why are the authorities spending so much time prosecuting these anarchists for committing acts of violence when hundreds and hundreds of my people are being killed uh, by illegal outlaws in the South? And of course, his, his call was not, his cry was not. I mean, the Republicans tried to do something. It was actually, Grant sent troops into South Carolina to try to suppress the Klan, but that only lasted for a little while. How, uh, what did the anarchists want? Yeah, what did they want? That's yeah, what was their governmental yeah. suggestion? <laughs> well, of course, they didn't want government, as we, we, we don't normally think of it. That, that, that was one of, um, I, I realized these people were going to be at the center of my story, and I really felt like I, I wanted to try to convey to readers today as best I could what they did, what they did believe, what they did want, because um, the, the word anarchy then and now really means all kinds of things like um, synonymous with um, perpetual chaos, disorder, violence, uh, unruliness, uh, the, the rest, you know. And that isn't actually what they had in mind. They, they were um, primarily against the modern nation state. They had come from places in Europe, the uh, Bismarck, Germany, the Emperor, Austro-Hungary, uh, the Tsar of Russia. The, these, this was the national state to them, the, the state that put people in prison, that drafted people, that taxed people. Moreover, the state did absolutely nothing for them. They, they were lived in these village communities. They were artisans. They were farmers. They produced their own goods. They met in their congregations. They managed to get to market somehow, and they had some kind of rudimentary forms of government. And that's what they thought was the more genuine human form of society, not something governed by the national state. So, furthermore, they believed in production on a cooperative basis, and they knew the national state wouldn't uh, wouldn't allow. They also were, um, you know, winning followers because at that point in American history, the Gilded Age, uh, national politics was so awash with corruption in the sense that 
in a way, uh, national government. This was long after the age of Lincoln, you know, uh, that, that national government had lost its credibility. So they wanted small local cooperatives to be the form of government and distribution. And that was their, uh, that was their vision. And something like that actually did take place in Spain. Uh, in, in the northern regions of Spain, uh, the anarchists did organize themselves that way before Franco and the fascists destroyed them all. But, but that, that was actually something they put into practice, that form of organization. <clears throat> was, uh, was there an option? In other words, the capitalists, the, the uh, industrialists of the time, uh, if, they gave, uh, if any capitalist gave to his workers an eight-hour day, he wouldn't be competitive. So he, he couldn't individually do mm -hmm. that economically. Am I right? Uh, I'm wrong. You're wrong. Okay. Well, good. good. Yeah, I, I mean that's what they that's what a lot of them said, particularly the bigger ones who could afford it. <laughs> in other words, in other words, McCormick had no competitors, <laughs> uh, and, and in fact, um, a lot of them were conceding. The, the people in the brewery industry conceded uh, because what they really some of them realized what they needed was productivity, not hours. Right. So, so they could remain competitive if they, if they got if they got production out of people. So, but that was generally the argument that was used. We 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 can't remain competitive. Whether it was the only reason, I don't think. I don't think that's that's true. I mean, the whole idea that workers in a group, a class, would make a demand <coughs> that forced forced employers to comply with was in itself objectionable, I and mean, they couldn't allow that precedent to be set. Yeah. Well. Um, in fact, I think it was in 1886 that, um, that uh, Andrew Carnegie agreed mm -hmm. to eight hour day mm -hmm. rather than 12. Yes, he did. At Braddock and um, at, at Homestead. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and none of his competitors followed suit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, in 1892, he, mm -hmm. he decided that he had to break the union. That was one of one of the reasons, and and the, the main reason, though I think, was that Carnegie and Frick decided they simply, whether they had an eight-hour day or not, they couldn't simply share any kind of decision making with the union. They they couldn't have somebody who represented the workers that had real power because it diminished their control. I think. Um, but, but it's also true that the, the economic understanding of the time was very primitive. I mean, in the 20th century, U.S. Steel gave, you know, workers the eight-hour day. Well, maybe we can get them to be more productive in eight hours than they are in 12. But, but at that point, a lot of people didn't see that. They just thought, we need the maximum, you know, the maximum of these people. So there was a conflict of economics over that. You know, what, what, they also said they couldn't afford to raise, well, you know, I mean, they couldn't afford to raise wages because they wouldn't be competitive. That argument was always made. Was there all women in this? I don't write the books, I'm sure. Yeah, no. And what happened to Lucy Parsons mm -hmm. afterwards? Did she continue her tradition yeah. of her husband? Right. Well, well, women uh, in the Knights of Labor were um, surprisingly prominent in small numbers in Chicago and other cities. It was one of the, because the, of course they weren't involved in political parties, they weren't involved, they didn't serve on juries, they didn't become newspaper editors. So in fact, the Knights of Labor was a, a way in which the Women's Christian Temperance Union, that was the big organization, the biggest of the time, and the Knights of Labor offered them a forum and an opportunity, you saw the photograph here, of them sort of making their claims in public debate and, and, and what kind of a society they wanted. Uh, Lucy Parsons and her friends had been involved in that and then became not just prominent women in Chicago but notorious women because they were out there at picnics and German beer halls, standing on tables telling workers to arm themselves, it was way beyond what the press of the time frequently referred to them as uh, Amazons, that this was something that they had, and they began this tribe of women who had taken on the characteristics of men. So it was quite a scandal for the time. But this kind of movement did bring families in. It did bring uh, wives and young women into uh, the struggle for the first time, particularly young working women. This is the first time, 1886, that women had been on strike uh, in any significant number in Chicago. Um, and Lucy Parsons, um, out, you know, outlives her. She lives a long, long and very difficult life, kind of dedicated really to preserving the memory of her husband, at first to the cause of anarchism and then to other kind of uh, 
uh, uh, radical uh, causes. She becomes, uh, continues to be a notorious figure, constantly arrested. She and Emma Goldman, I think single-handedly, along with Margaret Sanger and the IWW, push the envelope around freedom of speech. They're always getting arrested wherever they go because they're giving a speech somewhere and they keep going to court and trying to get the Bill of Rights to mean something for them. So she makes a contribution uh, that way. And at the end of her life, she's kind of a, a legendary figure. When um, the unions finally come back to Chicago in the 1930s to the McCormick plant, she's still alive. And they, in 1941, they have a, a parade and she's 88 years old and she has a special wagon that she's sitting on and she's you know driven through the streets of, of Chicago and that was her, her last May Day she was uh, died in a fire in her home in 1942 and the Chicago police confiscated all of her letters from Albert and all of her papers and all the things that she had had from people all over the world she was quite a figure in, in England too she went there yeah I'm interested in your reaction to uh this was a little less than a year before your book came out. There was, as you know, an article in the oh, way yeah. where a historian alleged to sort of mm -hmm. examine some of the material forensic yeah. evidence, raw and bomb fragments, and so on. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it caused this, this big controversy, claiming that, that perhaps uh, the prosecution arguments at the trial, which had been in part based on allegedly scientific examination of bomb fragments linking them to the anarchists, has been verified, and all, all us left-wing historians have overlooked it for a hundred yeah, years. Yeah. Uh, sure. yeah, this is the what we call the CSI, the Crime Scene <laughs> Investigation Group. I had I followed that very closely and was involved in that debate and spent quite a bit of time trying to address these issues, these forensics issues in, in footnotes. <laughs> My editor said, you can do it, but not in the text. <laughs> what he didn't want me was arguing with other historians while I was telling my story. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there there was this uh, kind of very strong view that emerged um, among scholars of the Haymarket case, just like there was, uh, well, a little different with Sacco Manzetti, because I think that the scholars are kind of evenly divided on, on, on this, the guilt or innocence of Sacco Manzetti, but in the Haymarket case, there was a sense that these four men had uh, clearly not actually thrown the bomb uh, and therefore were unjustly uh, tried and uh, wrongly executed. Now, the, the, the controversy you're talking about is, is an examination of uh, the bomb fragments that are still in an archive in, at Yale now, actually, and showing that these fragments did probably come from a bomb manufactured by one of the anarchists who stood trial for murder. And it's not conclusive, I mean, but, it, but it does suggest that um, the case isn't as closed as historians have tried to make it. Um, however, they, it, 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 it still doesn't, even if the bomb had been made by Lewis Lang, and it probably was, it doesn't necessarily um, mean that the four men who died on the gallows were involved in a conspiracy with someone who threw it. And so I think it's really kind of picking over old evidence and maybe being a little bit uh, revisionist, you know, trying to... Uh, trying to talk about uh, sort of maybe a little bit of watching CSI a lot and sort of seeing this. I, I think it's, however, um, the, the thing about these cases, the Sacco Vanzetti case as well, one of the things that makes them so intriguing is that people will argue about this forever, you know, what, what the, true, the true, who the true perpetrator was and so on and so forth. Uh, so so I, I, I dealt with it, but I didn't want to make that a, a sort of preoccupation of the book. Do you witness that uh, the young generation, they're hard, they're hard to, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to get their attention even when history is told as a good story, and why is that? Mm -hmm. Right, well, you know, I, I don't, first of all, I don't, I think there is some truth in that, but I'm not sure that my generation of high school students was all that compelled about history either. I mean, there's always this assumption that somehow there's been this great declension, you know, that we all, we all loved reading about the navigation acts, and you know, I mean, I, I think, yeah, and remembered what hap, what they were, you know. And I, and I don't think that's. I think it's it's always been a difficult, as the teachers would say, subject uh, to teach, and particularly when it's testing. You know, we have high stakes testing in Massachusetts now. We all shudder because now history is going to be on the test that you have to pass for graduation, and, and when it's taught that way, it's not much of an invitation to good storytelling or to probing the student. I just visited uh, my friend who's a principal at High Tech High 
over here in San Diego, in, in their humanities and um, liberal arts, they don't use any textbooks at all. It's all research. It's all saying to the students, okay, here's, here's the outlines of what happened in Chicago. The entire trial of the Haymarket uh, is, on, is digitized. It's at the Library of Congress. Go, go into, the, in, into the website and find out what happened and come back. Now, that's a different assignment, isn't it, than let's, let's, let's remember, and by the way, care about what you're reading for the test. So, so I think, I think that's, um, that's part of the problem. Um, I, I think the larger problem is not, that raised by television movies is not just about historical awareness or historical consciousness, but about reading. I just don't know if young people um, have the kind that, it, yeah, I mean, I, I, anything. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, they don't read the newspapers. I mean, I think that's the problem. So history is not uh, alone in, in that, I mean, literature. And, and so I, um, I'm not quite sure how to address that, but I do think I've spoken many times to younger people and uh, compelling narrative, strong characters, Tragic stories still do have some hold. My my son is a is a great admirer of um, the Lord of the Rings. We watch that together. We watch the DVD and we talk. Peter Jackson talks about how that story was constructed and how he used Tolkien. And you could say, well, that's all fiction. But in fact, when Tolkien was writing it, he and Peter Jackson was saying, we've got to make it seem like this really happened. That this really was history. And so, you know, what if what if you did that with something that really did happen? That's what I tried to do in the book. And it was based entirely on, as my editors, I said, hey, do you think this book is going to attract the kind of readership that I want? He said, it's all in the writing. He said, it's all in the writing. So, so I think that's, that's part of the, the problem. I, mean, I don't even know, for example, if young people are reading David McCullough and these books that are on the national bestsellers. Um, so on the other hand, I teach college, so I'm not the best person to, to give you a so, so I thought maybe you were going to ask about some other um, aspects of, of narrative, which, which writing narrative, it's, a lot of reviewers, and I, I take this as a compliment, uh, said, well, this book is written like a novel. It reads like that a novel. That would have been my next question. Some people, someone actually said, it is, a, it is a novel, Green's novel. That is. So, so I, 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 you know, I took that in a way as, as a compliment that the story keeps you wanting to see what happens next and to see what happens to these characters. Even though I tell the reader right away in the prologue what happens, they still want to read that, and that was the idea. And this really uh, comes uh, not so much from uh, my work as a scholar of history, but from filmmaking. I worked quite a while with some documentary filmmakers, and, uh, and I've read a lot of um, books about screenwriting. Uh, John Sayles wrote a book about his making this film, Haymarket, about, uh, sorry, about uh, Make One. So I, I try to think about suspense, about how you how you plot a story, and so and to to um, and another reviewer said, and I don't I, I think this was a compliment. I'm not sure though. He said this this book is um, not analytical, but he said it's argument by description. It is awkward. Is it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think some people feel like that, you know this is where the ethics come in. They feel like they've been tricked. You see, some this this reviews in American history. A reviewer said, he goes on. This first part of this review is this sort of lavish praise from a grand narrator, a great narrator. And then he says, almost in effect, but this is a dangerous book because he is getting you to identify with these characters and not stepping back and telling you how crazy they really were. And I wanted to provoke readers into thinking about um, about injustice, really. justice and injustice. So, if, and, and I'm not saying, the, and the moral is, but, but just to really, to, to be provoked. And, you know, and, and, and some people have felt that way. Some reviewers said, well, you can't read this book without a shock of recognition that this is about what's happening now, which I never said, you know, I just, but, but I wanted to raise those issues about um, crime and punishment and uh, those things. And, and, um, and I, think, I think narrative can do that. We were just talking earlier that the academic critics, a couple of them said, well, he, it's not analytical. It's not analytical. And so he doesn't show us anything new. So that's the way that we are trained to write in the academy. We really write for each other. And so you score in, in an academic publication by finding some new subject or some new interpretation or some new analysis that no, no one said quite exactly what you said. But, but the, um, you cannot write a PhD 
thesis in history as a story and do storytelling, that won't work. You know? So I'm at a point in my career where I can choose to do that, but it isn't, some, isn't really something that comes out of the academic tradition. It's another kind of tradition. Mm -hmm. you know, this is, what you just said is related to the point I was trying to make about the, these revisionist articles like the one in labor. Uh, I mean, one of, one of the criticisms of not breaking any new ground is that you're continuing the, the, the heroic treatment yeah. mm -hmm. of iconic figures of left-wing labor history. And it seems that the revisionism is oriented toward a sort of, I gotcha! Yeah. There's a point yeah. here that you missed. Mm -hmm. this point is mm -hmm. you. Same thing with Sapa Gonzetti. Mm -hmm. There was a big spurt several months ago that uh, Upton Sinclair had this uh, you know, letter from Fred Moore right. that he never revealed because it said that Fred Moore thought they were guilty. Everybody who knows anything about Sock and Ben say knows that Fred Moore said that after he was yeah, fired. Yeah, so yeah. why is it a revelation? And people took it seriously. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, and, you know, it didn't... <clears throat> Paul Alberich, who was a great historian of anarchism who wrote a great book about this in 1984, I think really wrote the book to prove the innocence of the men. I actually... I don't know whether I would, I mean, that was what, I mean, even if I had had some evidence that one of them was guilty, I would have just written that. I would have said that. I mean, it wouldn't have changed my story much at all, really, because the forces that compelled them to be there was what I was really interested in. And then the, what happened after it, after it, uh, after it, took, I, I was reading something about, I mean, I couldn't help as I was writing this book think about what happened in, you know, in 2001. I was reading a book about it. The New York Times uh, put together a summary of all the writings about 9/11 and the aftermath, and Richard Bernstein put it all together. And it's a book. It's a book called uh, Out of the Blue, Out of the Blue. And he begins by saying, "Well, if you if you want to know what happened at the World Trade Center and these other places in September 11, you know, 2001, you would have to go back." To the beginnings of the jihad, you know, a century ago. So, so I mean, there's this way in which you can take a particular act like that and see it as this ca the immediate causes of it, or you can go back a long way and try to see, well, and why did this happen in Chicago? Was it destined to happen there? And there's some reasons why something bad was going to happen there. Maybe not this. So that that's where the tools of the historian are, are, are valuable. Thank you very much, and a very stimulating discussion. Thank you.